Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Truxis, and I'm the Interim Executive Director of the Portland Chinatown Museum. I'd like to welcome you back to Hidden Histories. Uh, it's a series developed and created by the Portland Chinatown Museum. And I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement before we begin. The Portland Chinatown Museum acknowledges and honors the indigenous peoples and their descendants on the Lower Columbia and Willamette River region whose lands the city of Portland and our museum currently occupy. These include the Willamette, Tumwater, Clackamas, Kathlemet, Malala, Multnomah, and Matlala Chinook tribes, and the Tualatin, Kalapuya, who today are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, and the many other Chinookan peoples who established communities along the Lower Columbia, whose descendants are today members of the Grand Ronde, Warm Springs and Siletz Confederated Tribes of Oregon. A little bit about the program. Uh, this program is part of the Hidden Histories, Oregon's Early Chinatowns and Chinese Worker Settlements series, organized and moderated by the Portland Chinatown Museum in partnership with museums, state parks and forests, city governments and other educational institutions, organizations across Oregon. Hidden Histories aims to provide a better understanding of Chinese immigrant history and culture, and its importance to Oregon's growing Asian American population by sharing stories, archives, material culture, and histories of Oregon's early rural and urban Chinese communities. Today's presentation will be co-moderated by myself, museum board member, Sarah Chung, and my colleague, Kapiolani Lee. Here is Sarah, to share with you a bit more about today's presentation. Thank you, Anna. Hidden Histories series was made possible in part by a grant from the Oregon Humanities, a statewide nonprofit organization and an independent affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, which funds Oregon Humanities grant programs. For 50 years, the Oregon Humanities has offered programs and publications that have helped Oregonians to connect, to reflect, and to learn from one another. Today, we are joined by Dr. Chelsea K. Vaughn, Lisa Penner, and Sue Ann Ho, who will be presenting our program, Deconstructing the Astorian Chinese Experience. In 1870, Astoria had 13 Chinese residents. A decade later, that number had grown to 1,208 in Astoria proper, with another 924 individuals in what was then described as Upper Astoria, which is at the east end of town. Uh, with increased mechanization within the local canneries combined with exclusionary laws, uh, this would greatly reduce the number of Chinese laborers living in Astoria by the end of the century. And in the years that followed, the full scope of this history would be minimized and the poor treatment experienced by many in the community would be obscured. For this panel, our guests will look at this larger history, question what it means for this history to be deliberately forgotten and examine the experiences of the small Chinese American community that has remained. Uh, with time permitting, we will have a short question and answer period uh, to conclude the program. And uh, we would ask that if you have comments, to note that in the chat function of this webinar and for questions for our panelists, to please note that in the Q&A section or the function of this, of this webinar. So to start us off, museum staff member Kapian Lani Lee will introduce our guest today. Hi everyone. Um, I'm going to start off with Dr. Chelsea K. Vaughn. She began her tenure as a curator for the Clatsop County Historical Society in 2017. During this period, she has overseen the completion of the permanent exhibit, The Bounty of Clatsop County, as well as creating the temporary exhibit, Held for Observation, Votes for Women, Signs of the Times, The Model Study, and Filmed in Astoria. Most recently, Dr. Vaughn debuted Blocked Out, 
Race and Place in the Making of Modern Astoria, an exhibit that explores documented sites of racial exclusion within Astoria and the county more broadly. Important in this story are the multiple spaces occupied by Astoria's one sizable Chinese immigrant population, including both the upper and downtown Chinatown, bunk houses associated with the city's various canneries, and the numerous Chinese run gardens that supplied the larger community with fresh fruits and vegetables. This exhibit is currently on display at the CCHS Heritage Museum. Dr. Vaughn earned her PhD in public history from the University of California, Riverside in 2016. Here, her work focused on performances of history and how communities attempted to make sense of the collective past. Um, next up is Lisa Penner, who has been a resident of Astoria since 1951. She graduated from Astoria High School in 1958 and received an MA in anthropology from the University of Oregon 1971. She volunteered at the Clatsop County Historical Society in 1985 and joined the regular staff a year or so later. She served as a curator from 1999 to 2004 um, and archivist from 2005 to the present. She has also edited the CCHS quarterly publication Come Tuck since 1992 um, and has written for it previously. One of her main interests has been gathering archival materials for the CCHS Research Library. She put together a collection of newspaper articles and other materials uh, for a book called The Chinese in Astoria, 1870 to 1880. Produced resource material for many ex exhibits at the CCHS Heritage Museum um, and also has provided um, requests for historical information since the 1980s. Xuan Ho is an urban designer and principal at Resolve Architecture and Planning. Her placemaking design speaks to history, culture, and heritage. She holds a Master of Architecture degree from Columbia University and was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship and NEA grants to study high-density urban enclaves um, and to research five urban Chinatowns in the United States. Xuan designed the Garden of Surging Waves at Astoria's Heritage Square. This urban plaza episodically reveals the life of the early Astorian Chinese through custom design sculpt sculptural installation. The garden has received several design awards, including the ORPA Design Award and Oregon Main Street Best Downtown Improvement Award. Um, I'm now going to hand it over to Chelsea, who is going to start off um, the presentation. Hi there, everyone. I want to start by thanking the Portland Chinatown Museum for including us in this project. It's been very exciting to be able to work uh, with Lisa and Swen, who've done amazing work sort of uncovering the history of Astoria Chinatowns. Uh, this is done, as was mentioned, um, in conjunction with the exhibit Blocked Out, Race and Place in the Making of a Modern Astoria, uh, now on exhibit at the Heritage Museum, which in Astoria is on uh, 16th and Exchange. When we started talking about doing this presentation, one of the things we kept coming back to was what, what was hidden about uh, the history of Astoria's Chinatown. Uh, certainly, you know, other, we see other presentations here where the fact of a Chinatown was completely forgotten. Uh, that wasn't the case here as much, but it certainly was obscured in ways. It, uh, sort of what we found was that a false narrative sort of developed around what this history actually entailed. Um, and what it does is it very much minimized this history in significant ways. And this is the context, importantly, in which Lisa began doing her work uh, back in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, trying to actually fully uncover what this history entailed. You know, as part of our false narrative, what we determined was we found that uh, the large population, again, in the 1980s, a full one third of county residents were uh, you know, Chinese immigrants. Uh, that this population was very much treated then as temporary. When we talk about them, they were never, people were always, you know, just here briefly and then gone. So therefore somehow less significant in our history, which is very untrue. But also this idea that people were, that the Chinese immigrant population was uh, treated well, which again has proven uh, through very available resources to be untrue. But this narrative has been pervasive and continues to inform in many ways how people think about this history today. 
So when we started thinking about this, we thought, at least in part, what we should be doing with this work is trying to break through this narrative to make it uh, clearer uh, what this actual history was and trying to better uncover this past. On to provide context for Lisa's work, uh, even within our own institution at Clatsop County Historical Society, we um, had our own sort of institutional scandal back in the early 1980s around this history. A person who had worked with us as part of their work were obligated to write a story for our quarterly publication, the one that Lisa now um, edits. And in part of this, he wanted to write about the history of uh, the Chinese immigrant community as being well, mistreated, but mostly what he focused on actually was just efforts to exclude this community that was readily available from you know, sources from the time, like the, new, the newspapers did not, did not hide the, the, this fact or these, these efforts. Uh, the person who was then the editor, uh, Roger Tetlow, he pushed back against this. He didn't want to publish this narrative. He uh, thought that this was going to be upsetting. Um, ultimately, the board um, forces Tetlow to publish this article and Tetlow resigns in protest. I would like to read briefly uh, a letter that Tetlow actually wrote uh, in response to this article. It's just to give you an idea of what the actual dominant narrative was and how, you know, how important Lisa and Swen's work is in countering this narrative. So just to begin, uh, quote, frankly, the Chinese part of the article is the problem. You, as the author, may feel that it paints a correct picture of Chinese life in Astoria, but I, as an editor, and also as a native Astorian, to be fair, both men in question were native Astorians, uh, feel that it leaves an incorrect impression of years of persecution, segregation, and social ostracism. Undoubtedly, many of the things you have written are true, and did, again, well-documented in the newspapers, uh, but there are many things on the other side of the coin that, you also, that are also true, which you have not written. And in, in that point, he's referencing sort of a ways in which the local Chinese community was treated as exotic, as you know, a, a sort of a novelty, right? That the celebrations and various um, ceremonies were uh, noted and recorded by the by um, you know the local white community as something, uh, you know, something unique. <clears throat> in other words, after reading this portion of the article. I am left with the impression that Astoria was like Selma in its treatment of a minority. And in all sincerity, I do not believe that this is true. By a coincidence, I received another article written about the Chinese in Astoria some months ago. This was written by an old timer and gives an impression of the Chinese as he knew them. So again, uh, this was a common um, practice in the 80s with our quarterly in which people who were longtime residents of Astoria uh, were referred to as, as, as old timers and then their narratives of what they recalled were, were made up much of the content of our publication. Um, um, he paints quite a friendly picture of the Chinese. And this is the same one which appears time and time again in the old timer articles we receive. With a few noteworthy exceptions, the Astorians and the Chinese live side by side quite comfortably. And that sentence I wanna point out is doing a lot of work there, right? So it places the white Astorian community as the true Astorians, the Chinese as a separate community, and but also then creates the narrative that everyone got along great and that there was no strife. Right, going on. Um, I'm afraid that I cannot publish this portion of your article, which deals with the Chinese in Astoria without major corrections being made. You can of course leave it out entirely and use the other portions, or you can write it along friendlier lines, giving both sides of the question. I would prefer that you do the latter if possible. As I said, reckon through that I might leave out portions and rewrite others, but I feel I did, but I did not feel that I could do this without rewriting the entire portion. And then it would be my words and not yours. It is my feeling that if we publish that portion of your article, which deals with the Chinese, we would create a great deal of animosity towards Comtux, Comtux is the, the quarterly publication, from many segments of our readership. As I said previously, I did show this portion to several Astorians to get their reactions. And I am afraid that those reactions were not favorable towards your article. They all felt, as I do, that you do not deal fairly with the situation. So, oh, one more. Uh, now whether this is a fair judgment in your opinion or not, it is one that I must abide by. All right, so I think that this is a very telling letter because not only is it talking about how, you know, what the false narrative is that, um, 
that the population, the Chinese population of Astoria was well treated, well liked, and well regarded, though ultimately separate from the white population. Uh, and also how this how this narrative is perpetuated that you know this is sort of the story that people have generated and they, they continue to tell, but also that it becomes the expected narrative, right? That this is that for us to have published this, we would get pushed back. That that was the anticipation that. Um, that this is how people had come to understand this history and that by in that process, this becomes the only acceptable version that people were willing to accept. Right, and, this, and then importantly, this is the context in which Lisa then begins her work, uh, what she went on to publish and make available to people so that they would know truly what this experience was. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Lisa and I'm gonna start her PowerPoint presentation. The Native Americans, the Clatsops and Chinooks thrived on the bounty of this land where the Columbia River reaches the Pacific Ocean. The early settlers were land hungry people, most of them describing themselves on the 1850, 1860 and 1870 census records as farmers. But the land didn't prove to be quite as bountiful as the river, however. Early immigrants to the area experimented with preserving salmon in the big runs with salt or by pickling, extending this food supply through more of the year. It wasn't until the 1860s that the Hume brothers and Andrew Hapgood came to the North Shore of the Columbia, where after experimenting, they successfully designed a process for canning fish. There was a great need in the country for low cost protein rich food that would be available any time of the year. After a slow start, the market for their canned salmon expanded rapidly. Others copied the Hume's processes, which were secret at first, and started their own canneries along the south side of the Columbia. In the second half of the 1860s, in Astoria, there were the Booth and Battleette uh, canneries on the east end of town where Safeway is today. Devlin was a few blocks to the west and the Kinney Cannery on 6th Street. Contractors who had been bringing in Chinese to work on railroads began bringing them in to work in the canneries. In Astoria, vacant land in a marshy area between 7th and 8th Streets, about a block away from the Kinney Cannery, was leased to contractors who put up buildings to house Chinese workers and Astoria's Chinatown was born. In the next decades, it spread to side streets and blocks beyond for Chinese businesses and to house workers. The north side of blocks nine and 10 in, Adair, in um, McClure's Astoria was where Astoria's white proprietors operated saloons with all the vices, gambling, prostitution, and Shanghai. DeWitt Clinton, Ireland came to Astoria where he began printing the tri-weekly Astorian newspaper in July, 1873 and stayed until about 1881. He was on hand to witness the rapid settlement of Chinese immigrants. When he came to Astoria in 1873, he promised to help in the betterment of the community. He actively pursued some of those goals that he had set. He was certain that one of the biggest threats to the area was the employment of the Chinese. He claimed that the Chinese were taking the jobs of white men and women and children uh, who needed the work. He argued that the money the Chinese earned was draining out of this country and going to China. He wrote, it is foolish to spend time and money in the work of educating a horde of inferior people. His beliefs were shared by many others. 
Ireland's focus on the Chinese, however, turned out to be fortunate for researchers because it is from him that we are able to learn much about the early years of the Chinese in Astoria. These are samples of some of the things that he had written about uh, and complained about. This is a letter that we have in our archives and it is um, from uh, Jonathan Strong of the United States Consul, Consulate and he is writing to the um, commander of uh, the ship, the uh, Alden Bess. And he says, in accordance with your request, I have caused the bark Alden Bess under your command to be measured for carrying Chinese immigrants hence to Portland, Oregon, and find that you may carry in accordance with the letter of March 3rd, 1855, United States statute, 338 Chinese passengers to the United States, providing always that the spaces distinguished by you for measurement are entirely given up for passenger accommodation. Very respectfully yours, John Strong. The ship was, I think, uh, 860 tons. But uh, when you look at the ship, I just wonder how you could fit 338 people on board. So the numbers, these show the numbers um, in the 1870 census, uh, 13 people and each uh, was probably working for um, an individual family uh, or possibly a hotel, but unfortunately the census doesn't say. In the 1880 census, uh, five of the people that we know about Young's River were working for William H. Gray. And, um, but it shows that the numbers from 13 to 2,316, actually a number 17, uh, I counted it three times. Um, and on this number only one, uh, only 25 for females and that's about one female per 100 male, Chinese. This is um, a photo of a good part of Astoria, um, but it doesn't have Upper Town yet, and it doesn't have, it doesn't show um, uh, Union Town, because uh, Union Town at that time didn't exist. And it shows uh, the center of uh, the photo is the post office building. And that is one that uh, will appear in the next several uh, photos uh, because directly across the street from the post office is Uniontown. And if you look at it, uh, you can see there's very little there. Uh, on the block that is uh, next to uh, the courthouse, uh, to the post office across the street, in the corner uh, is uh, the courthouse. And then there's a house you'll also recognize in the next photos. And that is to the left of the post office and the block, there is a little building and it looks almost like a little face with two eyes and a nose. Um, that is a spiritual hall. And I'll show you it in the next photo or in a couple of photos from now. Um, now this is Union Cannery. I mean, this is Cannery, uh, Kinney Cannery. It was on 6th Street. And you see at the right of the photo is that house, the Spiritual Hall. Spiritual Hall was a place where the people had united to have meetings, uh, turn out the lights, and then wait for uh, the dead to speak to them. Um, so Union Cannery was, uh, began operating in the 1870s, although on the internet it says it, uh, later, um, but the newspapers actually say uh, uh, about 1876. And um, so they were in need of laborers to help. The Chinese who came to Astoria uh, settled in that area of block 10 
which was only uh, about a block away. So this is the post office where it is today, but the building that uh, is there today uh, was replaced in the 1930s. Across the street, there's very little there. It is um, the remnants of the former uh, marshy area. Uh, and uh, that was pretty much empty because it was a, a marshy area. Uh, one, a place where kids like to go and chase frogs. So there weren't any buildings put on that until about the time that the Chinese uh, arrived and there was a need uh, for housing for them. And this is uh, later in 1894, and it shows the post office. And across the street, there is a fully developed Chinatown. And you can see also Spiritual Hall now uh, on the left became a casino, a saloon. And then I think at one point it was a butcher shop and it survived for a long time. This is a close up of that uh, from that same photograph. It shows the buildings um, crowded together. Uh, what it doesn't show is that there is a lower level. And uh, there is a story uh, that we printed in Comtux by May Miller, who talked about um, a trip that she had made down below Chinatown. Um, she entered it from the street uh, commercial and um, walked all the way um, under there to Chinatown. They were led by someone because it was um, a very circuitous route. She said that um, she saw people in every room, uh, the whole under uh, ground there was uh, filled with people. This is a photo from the corner of uh, 8th and Bond uh, looking at Astoria's Chinatown. And this is, um, now this is after the fire. The fire happened in 1922. Uh, this is a 1940 photograph. Uh, at the extreme right, you can see a um, big tree. That was one of the trees that's still standing out there um, um, on Bond Street by the post office. And across the street where the original Chinatown was, was now a gas station. The Chinese had spread um, in both directions from there, but one of the most important places is um, in a grocery store that is uh, in a corner, um, the lower uh, central uh, part of the photograph. And we'll show uh, more pictures of that. Now this is that area, um, a map drawn by Cleveland Rockwell in 1868. And it's uh, a map that uh, extends all the way from Smith Point uh, to Tongue Point and beyond uh, to John Day. And it is so carefully drawn that you can match um, the little black buildings that he put on there with the buildings that were standing at the time. Uh, if you look and see that uh, X in the square, uh, that is where the post office was going to be built. It had not yet been built. Uh, from 1868 to 1870 um, was while they were building it. And across the street in the little black uh, square in the corner, uh, that is the, the courthouse, the first courthouse. That area with the diagonal lines, that is the marshy area where the kids played. And um, so you can see that the, the top part of block 10 is very lightly written with the 10, but that was mostly marsh. 
we have uh, this, the wonderful Sanborn insurance maps that gives details of each uh, block. Now, this is the same block. The top one is uh, 1868. And it shows that there was uh, some building there. And we believe that the first person who had that property um, or who had it before um, Chinatown was built was a woman who had a boarding house there. So uh, Conconley Street was Astor Street. And um, so the one um, Sanborn map is from 1884, the next to the right, 1888, and below 1892 and 1896. And you can see at the bottom of the block in each uh, drawing is the area where uh, the Chinese lived. And then if you look at the top, you can see there's a whole different kind of area. This map is from 1908, and uh, it's the same block, block 10. And at the bottom, at the south side, it shows uh, Chinese quarters. And uh, up on the north end, you can see the, uh, the stores are actually saloons. And the FB, the female boarding for the prostitutes. And the rooms on the right hand side by that saloon, I think were on the main floor, although it says second floor. So it may have been a saloon just on the bottom floor and then uh, the girls upstairs. This is a map of the extent of the 1922 fire. And you can see block 10 totally escaped the fire. But block nine, where uh, many of the businesses, Chinese businesses had moved, uh, the southern part of it uh, was destroyed. And for some reason, it looks as though they, the top half of that block where all those um, saloons were, that was uh, still preserved. And um, the post office block is marked in the coast, uh, courthouse. This shows when they put the road through, they put the road through block 10, where Chinatown had been. And uh, block nine, uh, part of that, uh, they cut through too. Now, all of that is on under concrete. Um, it would be wonderful if they could do um, a good archaeological excavation someday, but it doesn't appear that that will happen for a long time. This is a photo of the Bing Kong Bo Liang Tong uh, building, and that was on Bond Street. It was uh, on the corner of 8th in Bond. And we have another number of pictures of that. This is, uh, shows a little bit uh, of the Tong buildings on the right. It has an unusual front facade, but here they're tearing down some more of the buildings on the story. Now, um, Following will be some photos of the, the canneries. And I uh, thought it's important to add this statement uh, that according to Cortland L. Smith's 1979 book, Salmon Fishing on the Columbia, the contract labor system was an exploitation of uh, labor uh, by both canneries and Chinese, uh, the Chinese contractor. Wages were low, food was poor, consisting of boiled rice, seaweed, and tea. The contractor sold clothing and other items to workers at exorbitant prices and added to his profit by assuming the role of the house in gambling activities among the crew. Drug abuse was another characteristic of the contract labor system. Now this shows uh, some of the canneries along the Columbia. And again, it, it is missing some uh, from both ends. But if you read the numbers, it's just rather amazing. Anglo-American Packing Company, 
William Smith's Cannery, J.O. Hand Third and Company Cannery, Fisherman's Packing Cannery, um, my name is a box company, uh, Astoria Barker's Cannery, Battlet uh, and Company's Cannery, uh, A Booth Packing Company, uh, West Coast Packing, and on and on. So in many of those places, they also had boarding houses for the Chinese and for their other workers. Now, these are a series of photos of the canneries. Uh, and this is not by date, but it's by um, what they're doing in the canneries. So this is uh, unloading the fish. Uh, here is, uh, they just dump the fish on the floor. A lot of fish. They could not stop until they got through taking care of the day's catch. It could be a very, very long day. And here is someone, and I think that that might be Sue Saget, but I'm not sure. Um, and he is operating a, a hand-operated uh, slicer for uh, salmon. And here is the, one of the last processes is it's adding uh, salt and salmon oil to cans. Um, I'm not sure if that's uh, salmon or tuna. Uh, this is a card that's rather typical for the date. Uh, Chinese laborers at an Astoria cannery in a stereoscope card uh, about 1920. Couldn't pin the date down exactly. Um, Accustomed to work for starvation wages and to live on a few cents a day, no American laborer could compete with the Chinese. They lived in mean and dirty places and ate the poorest of food and no work was too bad for them to do. As the numbers increased, they became a menace. The American labor must either sink to their low standards of living or give place to them. Uh, and this is the end of the um, pictures, just about. Uh, it must have been difficult opening that oven with all of the heat that came out. And here uh, are women workers. Uh, and sometimes you see children uh, working in there. Now, I wonder if that's Sue Saget again. Uh, in uh, probably it looks like the port buildings and they're going to getting ready to ship uh, the canned um, fish onto the ships. Columbia River uh, uh, canneries combined into what they call the combine uh, renamed Omobi and um, uh, and uh, many Chinese worked for uh, the, the two biggest canneries that were here then. Now this is a drawing from a Sanborn insurance map of a Chinese boarding house. And I found a picture and I think it might be um, for the same one. And this is by Pier 1, 1915. It looks like a pretty old building. Uh, this is another photo of what I think is the same building. Uh, this one uh, possibly could be the same one. I know there were a lot of changes in building net racks and uh, the docks. But uh, what is interesting to me is that um, little building there on the left, um, an outhouse apparently, didn't look very safe. This is the Lung Queen store uh, that uh, many people uh, remembered, a uh, grocery store. And evidently it was the second store. Um, and they also owned the Astoria Dry Goods Store. And then next to that was the BK, the Ming uh, Kung Bo Liang Tong building. Uh, this is Johnny Lum in the grocery store. 
and I've forgotten the name of the person next to him, um, but um, Johnny is familiar to so many people. Um, I, I saw him one time at uh, the care center when my mother was uh, there recuperating after an operation, and uh, Johnny was playing the piano, and I asked him uh, what he was doing and why he was doing that, and he said, oh, he liked to do that. Uh, he said he played piano in a uh, different um, uh, care centers in the area. Now, this is Art Chan's family. Art Chan's uh, grandfather's the center, and on uh, the left is his father, and the right is his uncle. And this business was on uh, Commercial Street in upstairs. Um, next door as a neighbor was Bridget Grant. Uh, so I uh, did an interview one time, Art invited me over to his house and I interviewed his aunt and I asked her, did you uh, ever know Bridget Grant? And she said, oh yes, she was a nice lady. She used to give us candy. Bridget Grant was known for Shanghai. So this is um, Art Chan's grandfather uh, behind, there's a father and um, there was a half uh, Art half uncle um, who had um, his mother had um, evidently died and he was given to um, Art's grandfather's brother because he didn't have any children. And I interviewed the, the little girl there uh, as an old lady. Well, this is uh, from the city directory and there's a lot of businesses here. There's restaurant, laundry. These are all, uh, mostly Chinese, but you can see a few uh, Japanese businesses uh, in amongst them. What I think is really interesting about the list is to see the number of labor contractors that are on there. And uh, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven labor contractors. So evidently being a labor contractor is a way to make a good deal of money. And I think that um, the, we're not necessarily always bringing in labor from China, but they were also uh, had people's names on their list who were living in Portland and would come to Astoria uh, to, uh, during the fishing season. Now they're um, just like the Finns and the Swedes and the Germans, there were uh, there was uh, a fraternal and beneficial organizations for the Chinese. Uh, about six tongs in the early years, and uh, one that was uh, organized and um, lasted probably one of the longest was the Hip Sing Tong organization, and the uh, other was the Bing Kong Bo Liang Tong, um, and they uh, were forced to move to different addresses because of uh, different yeah, events, the fire and um, the moving of the, uh, the building of the highway. This is a, a nice photo of the Bing Kong Bo Liang Tong at 2633 Bond. These are members of the Tong and um, seated in the front on the right, uh, you'll see two well in the center and, and right. Uh, two of the most important people in Chinatown, and that is from early on uh, for a long time. Um, Wan Fuk Lam and uh, Chen Chan Ah Dog. And uh, Art said that he had lived with um, uh, Ah Dog's wife um, when he had um, uh, uh, lived uh, in Astoria. Uh, at one time in his life when his, um, uh, after his uh, father had died. Uh, and the little boy at right, I don't know if you can see him in this photo, um, but he was um, Harvey Chan, who was Astoria's weatherman for many years. And Harvey said that he became a weatherman because um, he had been sent to China to go to school. And while he was there, there was a, a typhoon. And after the typhoon, he saw bodies floating in the water. He wanted to make sure that um, he could try to help by becoming a weatherman and letting people know um, 
when uh, there was dangerous weather. Uh, and this is the Ming Kong Rolion Tong uh, meeting room. And we have a number of the objects in there. And those fabrics on the wall um, are ones that I believe we have in our collection. Uh, these are rules of the Long Tong. We brothers and sisters are living in a foreign land. We must help each other in good and bad times. Before there were few of us, but more coming all the time. Because we are unable to take care of all the problems and needs that arise, we must establish a new section of our Tong. The Tong is devoted to solving our needs and living in prosperity. So um, the rules are very similar to that of other groups. You know, members must help each other no matter what. Um, this is uh, what we have in our exhibit. Um, and it is the Guantong Shrine. Uh, this is the hanging there, Guandi, the god of war, coming by his son and squire. Uh, this is, to me, uh, fascinating because it shows that uh, a story of Chinese weren't just some very quiet organization, but that the uh, local group had an arm on it, which was to fight back um, when they, uh, they had a mission. And uh, occasionally that mission would be to go to Portland and uh, war on uh, the other Tongs. Uh, Gamble Unit Storia. Um, this was a project that I just sort of started by accident and I had a lot of fun with. Uh, what I did was uh, I was interested in the gamblers and we have the police records here. So I decided to pick a period of time, uh, two years, and go through the police records and pull out the names of those people who had been uh, arrested for gambling uh, the most often. So you can see um, here is J.L. Carlson arrested on the 23rd of May, 24th of June, 22nd of July, the 24th of August. And then I thought, hey, something's going on here. Um, uh, look, their dates are almost the same uh, for each person. For Kenny, it was the 25th, the 24th, the 25th, 24th, uh, and so on. And then um, I read in the newspaper complaints that the police had a system of um, uh, issuing certificates, uh, uh, making these uh, gamblers pay once a month, uh, one day a month, uh, month after month after month after month. And it was uh, a fee system. And what it did was it collected money for the city of Astoria uh, to spend on playing the police department, uh, paying for the roads, uh, paying for anything that the city needed. Um, but it was not intended to stop the gambling because if they stopped the gambling, they wouldn't have that money coming in. So here's a list of uh, Chinese who had been gambling the most. And it's the same thing. See the numbers, the dates, 31st, 30th, 31st, 30th, 30th, 30th. So that was happening with uh, the Chinese too. So then I thought it'd be fun to put the numbers together and see what happens. So I did, and I thought if you draw a line between uh, each of those, um, you would come up to uh, a sort of bumpy, but still a fairly straight line. And that indicates um, it was a system to bring the money in. So certain times of the year, there would be a lot of uh, white uh, gamblers operating. So in those months, you go collect from them. But then when they weren't around, well, the Chinese were here. So they went in and arrested the Chinese. Uh, there are many proposals to get rid of the Chinese and these are a number of them. Uh, just really nuisance laws, uh, not uh, all of them put into effect. Um, this is one of the Astoria's laws uh, was um, trying to keep anyone from carrying uh, poles. Uh, this is another kind of a nuisance thing, but it's federal government uh, did this. Uh, they required uh, businesses uh, that belong to Chinese to list all of the, the partners and how much they owed. 
But the Chinese made good use of it. Well, this is another unfortunate uh, nuisance thing too. Uh, oh, and the Chinese here brought um, a dragon. And uh, I show these pictures down at Marysville, California. And there was a man who said, that's his, his dragon. That's a dragon from Marysville. And they brought that up here for the parade. Lisa, that is a wonderful image. We're wondering if we can pause really quickly um, to transition to Suen. No. Oh, Lisa, we just wanna let you know you have about 10 minutes left. Okay, you have, you have 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, this here is a sample, uh, a photo of a boy with a pole, the kind that was outlawed. But it looks as though this was for a, a parade. And the fabrics here uh, might look familiar. I think they're the ones that we have. Um, this is the group here. Um, the boy on the left, on the bottom, uh, young man, he uh, is uh, our Chan's father. Uh, this is a school that Chinese children had to go to school, uh, uh, Chinese school, after the regular school and on Saturdays. Um, this is one of my favorite photos. This is R. Chan and his grandmother. And uh, his grandmother had gone back to China uh, with her husband when, uh, because he was uh, not well. And so Art had not seen her for a long time. So when he was in the military, he got permission to take uh, a plane flight to Hong Kong uh, and um, he visited his grandmother. And this is a picture of Art. He's come here uh, many times, it was regularly, and he brings us a big bag of photos. Uh, and Duncan Law is someone everyone knows. He's um, the inventor of a uh, seafood pellet. Uh, and the center here is named for him. And at the top of the steps, you see a Duncan Law and there is his grandson. And down at the bottom of the photo is Duncan Law's son. Uh, this is uh, Wayne Saiget. And he wrote a story about um, his wartime experience that is just fascinating. And Ellen Cole, um, she's the only one that I didn't know, um, but her family had um, the uh, fireworks company. And uh, this is um, uh, something that advertising it. Uh, and Warren Can, uh, I never knew him, but he was a longtime operator of the Hankow Chop Suey Inn and one of Seaside's benefactors. Uh, and for these are things that you should see. We had a lot of help from Dr. Chu Mei Ho and Dr. Bennett Bronson, um, to, uh, who studied the material that we have in our collection and uh, wrote a story that is in our context. Uh, and there are others who have done uh, some wonderful work talking about a uh, story as Chinese. Um, Cynthia Marconeri. Uh, wrote an article long before anyone else seemed to be very much interested in the Chinese in the story. Um, and um, it, that was published in our magazine. Uh, and we have uh, other ones too. And um, I think David Lum's book, What a Great Ride, The Family Story of David Lum, is the real key to understanding what life was like here for someone growing up in the Chinese community. And I think everyone should read that book. And that's all. All right. Thank you, Lisa. All right, uh, Kapiolani, we're ready to trans transition then to Swen. Great. Uh, Swen. Yes. Are you ready for your part of the presentation? Yes, I actually have my slide on. Um, okay. But I cannot see myself. So uh, if I am. Off camera, that's a setting from probably uh, the host side. Should I start? Yes, yeah, please start. Okay. Well, um, almost good afternoon, everyone. And I'm glad to be part of this um, presentation. And um, 
uh, it, it's really great to be able to see a lot of um, historic photos, uh, stories presented by uh, Lisa. And when I was brought on board in 2006, um, I didn't know much about Astoria oh. at all. And so I was I, asked, yes? I think you need to stop screen share so we can see your face and then go back to the screen share. We're okay. not seeing anything at the moment. Am I still sharing? Is that good? It's just blank still. Um, I don't know. Um, what do you want me to do? It is sharing, right? It's a blank screen right now for us. You cannot see it? No, I wonder if you stop share. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's you. Okay. Um, I will share it sure. for Duane. Is it uh, sharing now? Yes, now it's sharing. Okay, all right, sorry. Um, I'm going to just use my PowerPoint here. Would that work? Yes. Okay. Um, so when I was brought in um, during 2006, I uh, didn't know much about Astoria and I was working with uh, the city of Astoria um, as well as a uh, um, handpicked Chinese committee, Chinese Park Committee, um, and mostly are the handful of Chinese family members who are still living in Astoria. Um, it, what a privilege. Uh, a family of um, multi-generations, especially from the uh, Law family, uh, Duncan Law's family, and um, um, David Lum's family. And the original, so the story here, um, the number one on the screen here is the Centennial Legacy uh, Project that has the famous Astoria column. And I was asked to, um, design a Chinese commemorative uh, garden at the original location as um, indicated here, number two, which Lisa mentioned about the fact that there's a, um, a quite a bit of um, history of the Chinese cannery um, workers living and working in the area. And um, as we all know, not much has uh, been um, preserved. And of course, uh, block 10, was um, basically bulldozed because of building of the um, Highway 30. And um, as we started to look at the project, we, we also understand that this is the original coastline, river line, um, and all of this area was um, built on stilts and wood. And um, there was a chat saying that what caused the fire. Um, and um, I guess it's still a little mystery, but it was uh, starting from a basement of one of these wood buildings and then it spread below all the planks and piers and then burn um, on um, uh, December evening. And um, this site becomes a site that was available for consideration to relocate the original design for a Chinese commemorative park to the park right here across the city hall. This is the site that was uh, right before the city hall, in front of the city hall. And as you uh, see, it, it was a parking lot and it was actually part of a Safeway um, grocery parking lot. And here is the city hall. And I was originally asked to design a um, pseudo garden style Chinese garden, which at that time we just finished a, a garden in Portland. And we thought, um, why, why a pseudo garden when Portland has one? What about some, something that is really about Astoria? Which I 
I felt that the family within that committee is very um, dear in terms of their bonding to each other. There got to be something that we can talk about um, what the, the historians are about. And so here you see the um, project committee, Professor Duncan Law, his son, um, um, Kelvin Brown, his wife, uh, Ronnie, uh, Robert, and um, everyone, um, family of multi-generations. Um, Duncan was already not in good health. So we, um, and then of course, David Lum, um, um, we have um, uh, old timers uh, from Portland, uh, um, Norm Locke and Diane Cantor, who's actually from the Saigat family. And um, all of them um, starting to put in ideas of what they would like to see. And I wanted to, um, get more stories to this, this garden, not just about um, a sliver of the um, unpleasant time, but what about stories about the families? Because a lot of stories are available um, with the archival work, which is from newspaper, from printed material, which Lisa very uh, vividly and also um, um, Chelsea read through some of the uh, recorded text that um, I realized there is a missing part of the story, the voice from the Chinese. We never seem to have that um, documented um, um, in, in, in anywhere that's easily found. I'm an urban designer. So I can draw, um, that's all I can do, but drawings have no meanings if there are no uh, meaningful contents. Um, we did some drawings about a lantern that the committee wants to talk about salmon. So there's a salmon lantern honoring Duncan Law. They also want to have um, sturgeons. So we have sturgeon mosaic and the names uh, surging waves came about that um, becomes very appropriate for Astoria. But where are the voices from the Chinese? Looking back, this is uh, one of the um, uh, images from the, after the fire. And you can see they're they building uh, concrete um, chair walls underneath the sidewalk so that they won't burn down so easily. And then this is actually a site underneath the former Safeway, which is now the Heritage Square. This is actually at the corner of the Heritage Square that are um, traffic signal uh, control mechanism that are still there. The only thing that is historically still there um, at the Heritage Square under the sidewalk um, at um, um, the site and ideas about how to daylight it. So you can actually stand on the sidewalk and look down into the historic uh, remnants. So there's a lot of ideas about what this whole project can be. Um, and knowing there's very little um, funding um, and we have to fundraise everything. And um, uh, we, we have an idea about how to tell the stories, how to represent the larger context of where these Chinese immigrants came from, the heritage from their homeland, their culture, what is it that can be relevant in Astoria? So the ideas of being able to have timeline benches that tell stories about what's happening with the Chinese in Astoria. So there are five benches with 24 markers with some quotes. And then along the sidewalk, because this is a heritage square, along the sidewalk, the full super block length, 340 feet long, um, have different timeline markers talking about Astoria's history, um, marking some of the special dates, which um, on site right now, we have it um, for the length of the um, 
um, garden surging ways, and then the other half of the block uh, will also have um, timeline markers should that be um, the interest of um, the city of Astoria. There are donor screens because we need the community to help raise the fund. And then thinking about this can be a uh, outdoor um, amphitheater to celebrate multicultural, the richness of um, Astoria history. So this view is um, pretending to um, look at what it will be like from the city hall on the second level at the chambers. Along the sidewalk here, we have timeline, uh, I'm sorry, along the, the, um, the timeline benches, five of them, 24 um, cast bronze um, markers. On the verticals are the census data. So you will know at what year, how many Chinese were actually you know, living in the Clatsop County. On the top where um, the little quotes are all quotes generated by Lisa's uh, collaborative um, uh, project with Astoria uh, middle school students. And they have brought in a lot of quotes from the, the archival work. So in there it says American depression, political pressure expelled the Orientals. Chinese will be shot if seen fishing, restriction imposed on hiring Chinese. And you just learned how many Chinese were actually uh, in the backbone of the very um, profitable um, cannery works. And so every quote has different meanings and documented in the archival um, work. And then here's your uh, heritage a square sidewalk with railroad rail inserted and also quotes that are collected and put together by historian um, John Goodenberger, who is a historian in Astoria. So there are uh, quotes about trading post Fort George in 1813, et cetera. So magically, um, to, to make the story very, very short. We got it built in eight years. Um, took too long. Um, by the time um, we, we had the grand opening um, in, in May, Duncan Law passed away in February. It was very sad in my heart because um, I really thought he would be very um, proud of what we have accomplished as um, so-called the lineup of the um, stars. There's a Chinese saying, um, anything can happen if you have the three blessings. The blessing of the heavenly gods, the blessing of the earth, and the blessing of um, harmonious people. And it, it's, um, it's incredible. Um, um, special moment to be able to have this incredible, um, difficult project to come to fruition. And it's, it's to me, it's very important that um, we need to learn from history. We need to um, um, learn from history in the way that understand that history comes in the form of written words. Who wrote them? Who, who gives you the view and who is able to tell you how things happen? Um, it's it's in, incredibly important because it can have um, many different kind of um, responses. And sometimes I think um, we, we forgot the voices of people who were there um, were not heard. And so the, the history becomes skewered. Garden on Surging Ways allows you to, invite you to go through the um, moon gate, which actually has an echo effect. If you stand there and, and speak to the, the uh, gate, it will echo back. I think um, as um, Mayor um, 
um, Arlene Lemire said that um, city councilman, um, the late um, Russ War, and he's a tall man. So his head is right in, in the middle of the, the uh, moon gate. And when they walk through, and then Russ said, um, there's an echo and, and this place has, has feelings which I, I hope that that is what everybody can um, experience because um, there's a lot of symbolism in this garden that is not only trying to tell you the history which are along the timeline benches, um, but it also, and also there are quotes from Confucius, Lao Tzu, and a quote from the um, 13th century uh, nursery rhyme. There are quotes from the families. And at the beginning, when I was asking um, uh, the committee members, such as um, um, David Lum, Duncan Law, um, a lot of them don't want to talk about themselves. Um, I remember David Lum said, it's too sad. Um, I've, I've got nothing to say. And, and I thought, well, that's why we don't have the voices from, from the Chinese. We never heard from them. And so um, in order to honor his um, hesitancy, I, I then asked all of them to talk about, give me some stories about your parents, your grandparents, your uncles and aunts. And I didn't realize that opened up the floodgates of how, how endearing they were able to um, just keep telling stories about their families, their lives. And so um, by going through the moon gate, you are surrounded by these little clouds of floating quotes, like you're on a bus hearing someone speak something about something. There's no beginning, no end. Um, and I, and I, I think if we can just pay attention to the, the voices from the, our community, um, I, I do believe we can develop a, um, a higher level of empathy. And then so um, here's, uh, we collect many quotes. I couldn't put every quote on them and then they are all documented. Um, and then the, all these stories also don't have a name saying who said that, because I realized some of these quotes, I was told that they were actually um, very similar to quotes that um, uh, a Finnish lady, she said, my mom, my grandmother said the same thing to me. So um, the relationship between grandparents, parents and children Perhaps it's universal uh, that we can all share. We're not that different. Here's a picture of the Saigats. And um, they, um, they did something very unusual um, uh, amongst all the generous donors. Um, we, we had um, a, a fundraising of all the old timers. We made the, the Scout and Surging Waves um, um, logo um, inside moon gate with a surging waves in the moon into chocolates so everybody uh, we, we were able to fundraise and all that and tell stories and the saget what they did was very unusual was that it was multi-generation um, collaboration of course they bought um, uh, pavers, naming, everything has a naming opportunity because we, we need the money to, to build this uh, special place. But they bought the naming right off the two lions within the, um, um, at, the, at the base of the moon gate. They have a Chinese poem, very famous poem. And it says deeply, uh, missing and trying to remember um, Gong Chuk Kun. And um, Gong is actually their family name. Saigit is actually the first name of um, uh, Gong Saigit. But you know, Americans' um, uh, way of naming uh, in the immigration old days, they just throw names all over the place. So 
their last name family became Saigon, yet the original name is Gong. So the poem they have selected is the surging waves of the long river ride over the ones that have come before, just as new generations are founded on the old. That's what it's about. And if we as younger generation don't, don't do something to keep the older generation's spirit and uh, aspiration alive, we will never be able to pass it on to, to others uh, for enjoyment. There are other um, very endearing uh, quotes um, the late Janet Locke, um, they, they have uh, this quote um, on the score that is from Confucius, which uh, uh, Uncle Norm Locke said, my last name is actually not Locke, it's Ngan. Ngan is this word. And so um, again, um, a lot of times I think we are very uh, challenged in trying to understand why why certain things are, are one way and then it's actually um, the truth is actually something else and yet we never heard from the truth um, and only heard from the interpretive side. And, um, and sometimes I think we just need to listen and dig deeper into what, what the others are about and not be too um, um, naive about what, what we are all um, be just given um, with the first impression. So um, some of the quotes, uh, if I have a, a few minutes, um, these are quotes that I, um, I selected to, from a whole, whole bunch of quotes from the um, committee members and friends and uh, folks who actually were uh, growing up in Astoria. Um, some quote says, many admire her ability to raise her son during a time when of Asian descent was a so social obstacle. I remember one, uh, there was one quote, um, I put it on the screen and then um, the city actually asked me to correct the grammar because that's not uh, how English uh, is, uh, proper English is written. And I can only uh, uh, respond by saying that this is how the, the person um, presented in their way of expressing their thoughts. We, we should not correct the English just because they don't fit into a certain English um, grammar structure. So um, that's how this is put together on the screen. Uh, another quote, he prepared clocks with great skills and built cuckoo clocks with everyday material. My grandfather brought home salmon cheeks, a delicacy to the Chinese, but a waste to the cannery owners. After arriving from China, my dad took a year to save enough money working in San Francisco, and then he walked to Astoria. My mom butchered the frog, put the skin over little peach cans, and let it dry to make drums. He was a veteran of World War II and the Korean War, and filmed breaking stories on the coast for news stations and he was the official photographer for the Miss Oregon pageant, Ah Chen. You saw some of the stories before. He was the son and they always gave him the drumstick and he got tired of eating drumsticks. My mother graduated with a college degree but Chinese women seldom had jobs opportunities. So she settled for a housekeeping offer. I believe that is referencing um, one of the Saigon uh, matriarchs. He imported six pairs of frogs from Louisiana and set out to build his frog farm and hoped to sell his delicacy to restaurants. Two more quotes. 
Grandma said that dad was so sick on the boat from China that he would have been fed to the fish if he died. Now a seafood lab is named after him for the fish feed that he and his team developed. Professor Ngulao. The Chinatown was like a playground. He had no, we had no idea who was killing who. We just went ahead and enjoyed ourselves. I believe this quote was from um, Kelvin Brown. And his family name is actually Wong. He didn't know he was um, Kelvin Brown until he was uh, um, enlisted to the military and then realized all along, the, the record is actually calling him Brown and not Wong. Many, many of these stories. Um, I'm just glad that we got this project done. Uh, we gave Astoria a town square that was never there before. We are able to see um, many, many um, uh, events, uh, celebrations, um, um, quiet moments taking in place at this um, very, very special little uh, urban square. And it is the living room that people can laugh, cry, and ponder. A square is only a square um, if we don't put in some heart and soul into how to make it um, beyond just a place. And if we look deeper, um, there are many, many stories, many different materials, many colors, many texture, and they're all different, all in the same place, just like any community. And if we are able to say a community is only rich and wealthy, if we embrace everybody's differences, I think we're going to have a great place to uh, celebrate. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. A lot of the uh, comments here are uh, appreciation for the presentation and how deeply felt everyone had expressed. And I just want to add that I think that the name is so evocative. Um, the Garden of Surging Waves uh, really does also is used to express hardship and struggle. And these are all experiences that were shared by um, not only Astoria's early migrant groups, but all of America, but, but more so in Astoria, which was founded on a lot of hard work by all the different minority groups. So I'd like to uh, open this up now. We have time for some uh, questions for the panelists. And one of the first ones was, do we know what caused the fire uh, that was referred to in uh, the Astoria Fire of 1922? Do you wanna answer this one, Nicola? Oh, what was the question? The question was about what caused the fire in 22. Oh, that's still, um, uh, Unknown for sure. Um, there are a number of conjectures. Um, one that sound to me plausible was um, just that there was some packing material in the basement of a building and uh, material was too close to it, uh, to the to the flame, um, uh, some sort of a heating mechanism, uh, just a purely an accident. And I understand, I think maybe the because the fire was underground that a lot of those pilings of course were creosote um so that that helped spread the fire even yes. faster right yes uh it was a fire that was going to happen at some time um because the materials were all there all it needed was something to initiate it and uh, that was bound to happen sometime um, another question uh, relates to um, the history of the KKK in Oregon, where they acted in Astoria. Very much so. Um, yes, I can answer that. Yeah. Um, 
Hi. Yes, they were very active in Astoria, actually 1922, about the same time as the fire. Uh, the KKK sponsored candidates for city government are all actually elected to city governance. Uh, they aren't actually in office yet when the fire happens, but those two things very much coincide with one another. Are there other uh, questions that people would like to ask? Um, here is one. How was the Astoria Chinese community connected or not connected with other West Coast Chinatown communities? I, that's a question I can't answer. No? Okay. Uh, all I know is that um, at times um, uh, there wasn't a good connection. <laughs> Because um, the the um, one organization here was greatly feared by uh, some of the Portlanders. So we have a comment here from uh, uh, Dr. Chu Mei Ho, who you referenced earlier as one of the historians that has uh, that you've worked with. And she wanted to let everyone know that these was, this was a wonderful presentation. Lisa is one of the best local historians in the state of Oregon. And Sue Ann is one of the finest garden designers. Her story was very lucky. Oh, that was really sweet. <laughs> um, there are uh, some uh, uh, comments made from the Saigat family all around the country who really appreciate your uh, presentation today. And they um, love hearing the history um, of Astoria and about their families, their early uh, descendants. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for a, a really um, um, sweet compliment. I. I don't know what happened to my video, but it doesn't really matter. I can see all of you. And um, I, I just hope that um, we keep the stories alive. We keep telling stories. We, we keep, um, one thing I wanna say, being able to work with the community for, for all these years, I just wish um, all of us as younger generations, we need to reach out to the older generations a lot more. We need to ask them, tell me stories, because a lot of older generations probably have so much stories that they probably repeat themselves, but then as younger generation, we tend to just like walk away, block it off. And if we, we, if we go back and say, what about this? What about that? What about this? And uh, show me, tell me, um, I don't know. Or, oral recording, write it down, scrapbook, um, or just sit together and soak it back in. Because uh, when the older generation is gone, um, it's gone. And um, we, we, we all get older. And if we can find a moment to share our stories with the younger ones, uh, leave something behind. Um, that, that's the only way we, we can um, make the world better. There's a question here about, are there other things we should or can visit in Astoria to honor the Chinese community in addition to the garden? They're asking if there's other things locally to visit. Yeah, but I don't know, I can't quite think of it. Uh, yeah, we're trying to think about that. Um, as I think Lisa's presentation clarified much of what was most things have been destroyed. There's very little, you know, physical remains. Um, at one point, there was multiple Chinatowns in Astoria, as well as bunkhouses and other structures and gardens and whatnot. Uh, the only ones, very, very few buildings from that time actually remain. One is the old Lums building on 6th and Bond still stands. And there is actually a lovely mural that the high school painted on the back of that in honor of that building's history. And here's another question for Lisa. Are there any um, old stitched Chinese ledgers 
that are available in the archives or elsewhere in the community? Uh, yes, there is that um, one that I, I showed a photo of, um, of a page from it. Um, there are uh, two books of the Chinese uh, businesses. And what I had, uh, I had missed one of the slides, um, but one includes the births of children um, in uh, the United States, because um, that was the way that they could ensure on um, a, a legal uh, paper, the birth of a child who, uh, and that the child could now be a citizen of the United States. But there's uh, many pages in there worth looking at for uh, different businesses. And it has uh, the uh, people who had in invested in, in that business, uh, some people um, uh, in China. Um, in your records, have you found uh, examples of local ordinances within the city code that did target the Chinese Americans in the Astoria community? Um, um, there was more than uh, just the one about uh, poles, um, but I, uh, I can't my, think of it uh, right now. But we do have the books here of the city ordinances. Um, and this person references that he has seen uh, specific uh, regulations for restaurants and clauses within deed record uh, prohibiting maybe renting to the to the uh, Chinese. Uh, um, actually, so sorry about this. Uh, the exhibit we actually just put together um, deals heavily with this about actual sites. My share camera here uh, deals heavily there. Many of the much of our housing actually had restrictive racially restrictive covenants that was built post World War II. We found some evidence of that. We also had evidence uh, there was not, it, wasn't, it didn't actually become a ordinance, but there was efforts by the city to restrict uh, the Chinese gardens. Uh, there were uh, policies against having pigs, for example, within uh, the city limits that was specifically targeted um, a, a garden that's in Upper Town, China. Uh, so we have found a variety of ways in which both formal and informal, in which uh, there were efforts to um, control and restrict the Chinese community locally, unfortunately. And the fire ordinances too. Yeah. Um, they were very strict about that in uh, the areas uh, uh, in Chinatown, more so than they would have been the rest of town. So this will be the last question and uh, it's to Chelsea and it's actually from me. Can you tell us a little more about this current exhibit you have and how long it will be up for? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, right now, we, have, we don't actually have an end date. We, we, we just opened it. What it is, is we went through um, and tried to physically place acts of uh, racial discrimination on a map of Astoria. So. We looked for examples that we could absolutely you know, prove that, that were recorded in the newspapers or that were you know, restrictive housing covenants that we actually had seen titled to and things of that nature. So it, it, there's, um, so it's not just conjecture, it's actually like, this is what happened and these are where it happened. And this is how, you know, for one thing, how Astoria becomes such a very white space and how issues of race and racism are codified within our physical landscape. I, I, may I um, add um, a little bit of an angle here? The Garden on Surging Waves, um, at first, when it was proposed to put in front of the city hall, there was a, a tremendous apprehension from the committee, the Chinese community on that, on that um, um, at that moment, because it was too high profile a site, because they don't want, they don't, the committee did not want to um, be put in such a high profile site and offend other people in the community. And it was actually the younger generation was very apprehensive. There was a moment of silence and Duncan Law, um, tiny, tiny um, Duncan Law sitting at the end of the table. He clap his hand and like this, and he very quietly, I did not have it recorded, I regret it, but he said, 
this is a historical moment. We need to make a bold step to make it, make it forward with this. Um, we have to do it. This is very important. And then um, at the grand opening, um, all along, also at the grand opening, former mayor Van Dusen, he said, this is not Chinese history. This is American history. This is the history of the US um, city. And this is our history. So he was kind of scolding our, our committee and saying, this is not about your, your history. This is all of our history. We need to do this. It takes everyone to make something this complicated to move forward, but we all need to have that open heart and, and to recognize that um, we cannot clap our hands with one hand, we need two hands. So um, I'm hoping that we, we are able to see the difficult um, side, but also embrace the happy side and the future that we all collectively um, um, charge forward for a better, better time. Thank you so much um, for those powerful words and to our presenters, Chelsea, Lisa, and Suen for a rigorous historical presentation as well as just a poignant exploration of a community project on, on such a, um, a gorgeous scale. So we are very appreciative for your contributions today. Um, and I'd like to just say, if you enjoyed today's program, please stay tuned for the ninth and final program in the Hidden History series with Dr. Priscilla Weggers and Renee Campbell in December. Their presentation will take us to Pendleton, Oregon with comparing Pendleton's uh, Chinese tunnel myth with its above ground reality. And you can watch our website at www.portlandchinatownmuseum.org uh, in late November for more information about that. Again, thank you so much to our honored guests and uh, participants today for attending. Um, if you'd like to rewatch this program or would like to share it with others, a recording will be made available on our website uh, by November 1st. And again, that's www.portlandchinatownmuseum.org. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you.